Thank you, Jasmine. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we open your word, as we open your Bible, speak to us and Lord, use me to deliver what it is you want us all to hear and take home with us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'll never do that again. How these words have no doubt been said by each one of us at least once in our lives. And after reading Acts 21 and 22, we might wonder if after going to Jerusalem, Paul ever said to himself, oh, I'll never do that again. Because look what happens. He goes to Jerusalem, he gets arrested, and he basically stays a prisoner for the rest of his life. He's confined, he spends 12 days in Jerusalem. He's arrested, spent two years in Caesarea, has several trials, appeals to Caesar. He's taken on a prison ship to Rome and he spends two more years under house arrest in Rome. He gets briefly released, gets rearrested, and then beheaded. Now, But what we know is he never went to Jerusalem again. You see, this was his last time. And we want to ask him, did you ever regret your decision to press on to Jerusalem? So let's take a closer look at the consequences now of, of Paul's decision regarding Jerusalem and what these events can teach us. But first I want you to imagine what it would have been like to be on Paul the Apostle's missionary team. I think we've all been around a driven person, a driver. Now, I don't think he was, but at times it looked like he was. I think he was more called than driven. And, but he kept saying, I'm going to Jerusalem. I don't know what's going to happen. All I know is that everywhere I go, I get these messages from God that say, Oh, it's going to be hard. You're going to, you're going to get arrested. But I don't care because I'm ready to die for Jesus, he said. But as a team member, you say, oh, oh, wait a minute, Paul. That's great, but we're on your team. So what could happen to you could also happen to us. And that's why I say it may not necessarily be fun to be on Paul, the apostle's missionary team, because he was ready to risk it all. And if you're traveling with him, oh, it would look like he's risking it all for you as well. Alstair Begg, a pastor from years gone by, wrote a lot of different quotes, and there's a collection of his quotes in a book. This one is really quite fascinating. You think about it. We believe that all of scripture is equally inspired, but not all of scripture is equally inspiring. Now, there are some times when we read through certain scriptures, certain passages, you know, they just seem to jump off the pages. They just grab us. For example, we've, we've all read the story of David and Goliath, or especially Jesus in the resurrection story. And we're like, Wow, those are really great stories. This is awesome. But then we read stories, well, like today, the reading assignment that I gave you, we think, oh, all right, it is the Bible, so I'll honor it and I want to respect it. But why is it that we should all get together on a Saturday morning and listen to music planned for us by Martha Jean and all the other parts of our worship service so that we can hear a story that talks about why Paul paid for the haircuts of four men that he didn't know and, and we don't even know. So what's the point of that story? Why is that so interesting? Why should that be so interesting for us? Well, you know, we've been following Paul along his three missionary journeys, his planning of churches from place to place, and now there's this change in his direction, is moving away from this idea of missionary church planning, and now his determined road towards Jerusalem and Rome. 
And even though along the way, every city that he goes to, the Holy Spirit is testifying to him, either in his own spirit or through the testimony of others, that bad things are waiting for him. When he gets there and that chains are waiting for him, that imprisonment is waiting for him, that abuse, that difficulties and suffering, that's all waiting for him. But Paul knows that. And this is what the Lord asked him to do. And so he's making his way towards Jerusalem. And so here we are. We've arrived in Acts 21 and, and Paul has arrived in Jerusalem. And we jump right in there at verse 17, picking up where we left off last week. Verse 17, and it reads, when we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. He's here in Jerusalem. Brothers and sisters, Luke is speaking of the church as a whole as they, as they greet him. And then we go on to verse 18 that tells us James and the elders came and greeted him too. And it reads, the following day, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders who were present. And after greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry, and, and they glorified God. Now, those are a couple of easy read, feel good verses. But I think there's a couple of obvious things that can easily be missed here. And the first is this one. Paul is giving a very detailed account to the elders as they come together. He's giving them this very specific, this day to day, this is what happened. And here's who was there. Here's the day that I was in this town and this is what happened. And I suspect he probably told some of the success stories along the way, like back there in Acts 18, Crispus, you know, the ruler of the synagogue who converts to Christianity. Boy, that would be a great victory for the church at that point. And, and the leader of the Jewish synagogue converting to Christ. I mean, you gotta tell that story. But then maybe he also told them about Eutychus, about how he just didn't know when to stop preaching. And the next thing you know, this little boy falls out of the window, falls, he fell asleep during Paul's sermon to his death. And Paul thinks, maybe I should have left that one out. But he told them anyhow. And the second thing to notice is that Paul gives them a very God-centered account. Verse 19, Paul greeted them and reported in detail. He reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. I know too often our tendency is to talk about the amazing things that we've done for God in our ministries. But the Bible makes it really clear that without Christ, we can do nothing. And then if we're to be really, really honest about the things that are going on, then we need to make sure we always have a God-centered approach to what we're talking about. And I hope that we never tell anyone of, the, of all the amazing things that have happened in our church over the last five years, unless we do it from that standpoint of, look what God did. And remember, the credit belongs to God, and nobody was better at giving God the credit than Paul. You see, Paul was very faithful to make sure that he was not hoarding the glory that rightfully belonged to God. He had this very God-centered approach. He was saying, these are the things that God is doing through my ministry. What a God-centered approach and the right way to handle that. Look at verse 20. When they heard it, they all came together. And what they do? They glorified God. Again, this is the purpose of this God-centered approach. And we all recall back there in Matthew, it says that we are to be a light to the world. And why? So that others can see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. But now look what else is happening here in verse 20. They hear all of these things, they hear the great works and they begin to glorify God, but there's something else that's going on here, on here that's sort of hidden. And you can see it as you 
take a look at verse 8 to 18 specifically right there in 17 it says that the brothers that's the church collectively they came together to greet paul but then in verse 18 it says the following day paul went into james and all the elders were present uh oh they're having a leadership meeting there in jerusalem and the greater church body they weren't invited this is just Paul and James and the elders of the church. And as we read on, we see the reason that they're meeting. We hear what they're discussing with it. We hear and we learn that there's some tension going on here in Jerusalem. And if we take a look at it in verses 20 to 21, they said to him, they said to Paul, your brother, you see how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed? They're all zealous for the law. And they've been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or to walk according to our customs. Now they have a definite concern here. And you're going to see this expressed again in just a moment regarding the fact that Paul has come into town and there's this tension there's this tension between the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem and what they've been hearing about Paul, what's going on in his missionary journey. But as we read these, as we read this word, this passage of scripture, I think there's three elements that sort of just all come together to build this bomb, if you will, that's about to go off in Jerusalem. There's three elements here. And it's important that we recognize them because this can and does happen to us too. Now, first off, we see there's thousands of Jewish believers there in Jerusalem. And second, we see that they're very zealous for the law of God. But here's where the problem comes in. When you add this third element, that is, they are misinformed about Paul's teachings. Now, get the picture with me. There's thousands of Jewish believers they're fired up about the word of God and Christianity in the church, but they have this fundamental misunderstanding and it's either been misrepresented to them or they're, they're just wrong in their belief of what Paul's teaching, but it's creating this tension. And there's this apparent conflict taking place it's been taking place, but now Paul is on the scene and the elders, they call him together and they say, Paul, we've got this issue. And James asks, what do we do about it? Now, verse 21 tells us more about the issue. What their beliefs concerning Paul's teachings were that they believe that he's going around, reading from verse 21, he's going around teaching all the Jews to forsake Moses meaning the law, telling them not to circumcise their children or to walk according to our customs. So the accusation, the misunderstanding that's taking place here about Paul's teachings is that, number one, he's going around and saying, don't follow the law of Moses anymore. But then on the other hand, he's saying, don't follow the culture, the customs, the traditions of our nation, our religion, and our background. Now, if you recall back a few weeks, a few chapters back, we saw Paul having just gone through a Nazarite vow, that Old Testament Jewish custom. But right here, I don't think Paul is saying, get all these customs, all these traditions, all these feasts, everything that we've ever been about as Israel, let's just kick all that to the side. We don't need it anymore. He's not teaching that at all. And maybe even more specifically, he's not teaching any of these things to the Jews. And there's where the tension comes in. Because you see in their accusations about him, or the rumors that are going on around about Paul, it says there in verse 21, they have been told that you teach all the Jews about among the Gentiles. Now, you think back as we studied Paul and his journeys. That's not who Paul teaches. 
you know, he tried to teach the Jews. He tried to go to the synagogues. They never worked out very well for him. So Paul became the apostle to who? He became the apostle to the Gentiles. And now what is he teaching the Gentiles? He's teaching them, you don't need all of these Jewish customs, all these feasts, all these festivals. You don't need all of that to be able to have acceptance with God. Wow, think of that. Those are the cultural things that you are not a part of, and they're no longer, they are not prerequisites to Christianity. For you see, the gospel is really clear. Jesus Christ and Christ alone is what gives you access to God the Father. And that's what Paul is teaching the Gentiles. But those Christian Jews there in Jerusalem, they're completely wrong. They've been fed bad misinformation, or they've misread, or they've misinterpreted. Or it's kind of like, oh, you know, perhaps you've played that old game, people get in a line in a circle, and, and you pass the way, you start a word at this end, and you pass that word on around that circle, and it gets to the last person, and it's changed completely. Maybe that's what's happened here. So what we have are these thousands of believers. They're fired up for the word, but they've got bad information about Paul. And James asked there in verse 22, so what's to be done? What can we do about this? They're certainly going to hear that you're coming, that you're here. What are we going to do about it? Now I'm going to pause right there for a second. I think we need to give James and the elders in Jerusalem, I think we need to give them some kudos for the action that they took and the action they didn't take. And I think there's a lot to learn from this example right here. Well, first, what didn't they do? Well, they didn't just right off the bat, they didn't just assume that Paul was guilty of these accusations. I said, but I've heard it from thousands of people. And this is probably a way we would address it. I've heard it from thousands of people. It must be true. I've heard it from thousands of believers who are fired up about the word of God. So it must be true. Plus, I saw it on Twitter. And it was on 12 different Facebook posts. And, and everybody's following, about, following it. And they're writing about it. Oh, it's got to be true. And he must be guilty. And we're not going to go to the coast when he shows up there on his boat. We're not going to go greet him when he gets here. That guy, he's not one of us. He's teaching things that we don't want anything to do with. And therefore, we'll just keep him over there off to the side. And, and when he gets his act together, then he'll be worthy of fellowship with us. But for right now, we got a label for him. He is a sinner. But you know what? That's not what they did. What they did was they went to Paul himself. They called him in. They said, Paul, this is what we've heard. So what's going on? Please explain this to us. You see, there's this rumor going around about your teaching. And what are we going to do about this? What are we going to say? So James, he comes up with an idea. Verse 22, he says, we have four men who are under a vow, take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so they may shave their heads. And thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. And James goes on, but as far as the Gentiles who believed, we sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, from blood, and from what has been strangled in sexual immorality. Now we know Paul. Here's Paul. He's never been afraid to get in somebody's face. And if he didn't like it, he could have said to James right then, hey, you're the apostle of the Jews. I'm the apostle of the Gentiles. It's your people. It's your problem. You fix it. And remember, he wasn't afraid of being in prison, wasn't afraid of being beaten or anything like that. But Paul, 
he took the men and he took those four men and he took the next day and he purified himself along with them. He went to the temple giving it notice when the days of, pur of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. Now, what I want us to see here from this story, there are two pillars of Paul's ministry. There are two things that are accomplished here. There are two goals in what Paul is doing in his ministry. And I think there's a lot that we can learn here from this story. And here's what I like about Paul. Now, this is profound. Here is something really profound. I want you to remember what you think about. Paul was able to discern between what is essential and what is non-essential. He's able to discern between the essential and the non-essential. You see, he knew the sacrifice of this ritual, this Nazarite vow. He knew this wasn't essential for growing in Christ. He knew it wasn't essential for salvation, but Paul was flexible. He knew one of those unpublished beatitudes. Blessed are the flexible, they shall not be broken. In essentials, here's Paul, he was firm. In non-essentials, he was flexible. You think about it in our own lives, related to yourself. There are certain things that we just don't compromise on. If it's an essential point in our understanding, if it's an essential historic Christian doctrine, we're firm on it. But you know, if it's one of those secondary issues, maybe we could be flexible. And let's look at those two pillars. Let's put them into Paul's ministry and how he actually applied them. And number one, we know that Paul was really passionate about unity in the church. But number two, we know he was even more passionate about the gospel. If we go to our scripture reading for today, Philippians 2, 1 to 3, here Paul wrote to the people of Philippi. He says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourself. Here's Paul. I mean, he is fired up now. He's saying, if there's anything you can do to complete my joy, then you as a church, do it. Be unified. Love one another. Support one another. Have joy for one another. Be unified in what you're doing. Let's stick together. And Paul applied that very philosophy when he answered James. Now, he could have said, I don't have to do that. You want me to spend my money? They're wrong. They're the ones that have misunderstandings. Why don't you just send a letter to everybody? Let's post something on Facebook and let everybody know that, hey, you over there, you're all wrong. I was right. Now, just get over it. But that's not what Paul did. He says, no way. I will totally disadvantage myself for the sake of unity in the church. You mean to tell me I just shave my head, spend some money to cover those guys' haircuts, and we'll have unity within the church? I'll do that in a second. And now what he's really fired up about, it's the gospel. And we can turn over to 1 Corinthians 9. And here, Paul, he's written to the church in Corinth. And here's a church not exactly marked by unity, but a church that desperately needed grace. And he writes, beginning in verse 19, 1 Corinthians 9, Though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. And to the Jews, I became like a Jew in order to win Jews. And to those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law. Then I might win those under the law to them. 
And to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. And not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those that are outside the law. And to the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I had become all things to all people that by me, by all means, I might save some, and I do it all for the sake of the gospel. What's Paul saying here? He's saying here that in every decision I make in life, every issue that comes up, every problem, every should I do this or should I do that, everything passes through one filter. And that filter is, would this help me win those people or those people to the gospel of God? Then I might share in that blessing. You see, that was the filter through which Paul sent every decision that came his way. And so too should we. So as, as we're going to see in the weeks ahead, looking at Paul as he gives his testimony, realize he's going to be talking to Jewish believers, to non-believers, and he's always identifying with them the Jewish believers that want to kill him. He's identifying with them. He was constantly trying to find a way to relate to people on their level, but always, always, always giving glory to Jesus Christ. A Christian pastor from many years ago, in a collection of quotes from his book, he wrote, a leader is someone with a compass in his mind and a magnet in his heart. Let me read that again so you can, it can sink in. A leader is someone with a compass in his mind and a magnet in his heart. A compass is what you, nav is, is what you navigate by. You're able to tell what direction you're going. And the idea is that you think through you navigate through with your mind, your thought processes, your values, and where you think God is calling you. But it's in your heart. A magnet attracts people to your calling, your ministry, your vision. And think of Paul. You think of what we've been learning about his journeys. And, and here he is in Jerusalem. He had a compass. He says, I'm going to Jerusalem. I feel this is the will of God. But he also had a magnet in his heart. And wherever he went, he was able to attract different people to his cause, to his calling, to his ministry, and to the Lord, more importantly. And here's Paul. Here he is, he's confronted by some really, really tough obstacles but his compass pointed in one direction. His compass pointed true north. It pointed to the gospel, it pointed to God's saving grace. And it's along the way, his heart attracted people like a magnet. He wanted everyone to know of God's saving grace. You know, it mattered not to him if he ever got back to Jerusalem. He still ministered to people around him. Why is bound with chains? Why is house bound in prison? And as I thought about Paul this week and his ministry and all the obstacles he faced, I thought about us. And we feel right now like we are facing some major obstacles in life. Never thought we would be out of our church building this long and, and now who knows how much longer. But that doesn't change our direction. You see, we're still going to the New Jerusalem, and our compass is still pointing true north. And along the way, that magnet within our heart should be attracting people to God's saving grace. Let's pray. Oh, God in heaven, today we've seen another example in the life of Paul. What an example. We have seen how Paul related to people and your gospel 
and how you was focused on attracting people to your saving grace and how the obstacles this, of this life did not get in its way. He was willing to give up his own life on this earth to win the hearts of others. And Lord, our prayer today is that we have a compass like Paul and that our compass will always point us to the true north, to you. And we ask that we will have a heart like Paul, a heart like a magnet will, that will attract others to you along the way. And Lord, we know this pandemic, it's not a surprise to you. Just like you knew what was going to happen to Paul in Jerusalem and in Rome, it wasn't a surprise but you were with him every step of the way. And we know that you have promised to be with us every step of the way. And our prayer is that we will remember and recognize how you're leading us and protecting us in the difficult road ahead of us. Keep the compass in our mind always pointing towards you and the magnet of our hearts attracting more people to you. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen.